Section twenty two of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter nineteen. Making money in those days was so ridiculously easy. The trouble was to know how to spend it. One evening when I got home, I told Maud I had a surprise for her. A surprise? she asked looking up from a little pink smock she was making for chickabiddy i've bought that lot on grant avenue next to the ogilvies she dropped her sewing and stared at me aren't you pleased i asked at last we are going to have a house of our very own what's the matter i can't bear the thought of leaving here i'm so used to it i've grown to love it it's a part of me but i exclaimed a little exasperated you didn't expect to live here always did you the house has been too small for us for years i thought you'd be delighted this was not strictly true for i had rather expected some such action on her part most women would of course if it's going to make such a difference to you as that i'll sell the lot that won't be difficult i got up and started to go into my study she half rose and her sewing fell to the floor oh why are we always having misunderstandings do sit down a minute hugh don't think i'm not appreciative she pleaded it was such a shock i sat down rather reluctantly i can't express what i think she continued rather breathlessly but sometimes i'm actually frightened we're going through life so fast in these days and it doesn't seem as if we were getting the real things out of it i'm afraid of your success and all the money you're making i smiled i'm not so rich yet as rich as go in these days that you need be alarmed i said she looked at me helplessly a moment i feel that it isn't right somehow that you'll pay for it that we'll pay for it goodness knows we have everything we want and more too this house this house is real and i'm afraid that won't be a home won't be real that we'll be overwhelmed with with things she was interrupted by the entrance of the children but after dinner when she had seen them to bed as was her custom she came downstairs into my study and said quietly i was wrong hugh if you want to build a house if you feel that you'd be happier i have no right to object of course my sentiment for this house is natural the children were born here and i've realized we couldn't live here always i'm glad you look at it that way i replied why we're already getting cramped maud and now you're going to have a governess i don't know where you'd put her not too large a house she pleaded i know you think i'm silly but this extravagance we see everywhere does make me uneasy perhaps it's because i'm provincial and always shall be well we must have a house large enough to be comfortable in i said there's no reason why we shouldn't be comfortable i thought it as well not to confess my ambitions and i was greatly relieved that she did not reproach me for buying the lot without consulting her indeed i was grateful for this unanticipated acquiescence i felt nearer to her than i had for a long time i drew up another chair to my desk sit down and we'll make a few sketches just for fun i urged hugh she said presently as we were blacking out prospective rooms do you remember all those drawings and plans we made in england on our wedding trip and how we knew just what we wanted and changed our minds every few days and now we're ready to build and haven't any ideas at all yes i answered but i did not look at her i have the book still it's in the attic somewhere packed away in a box i suppose those plans would seem ridiculous now it was quite true 
now that we were ready to build the house that had been deferred so long now that i had the money to spend without stint on its construction the irony of life had deprived me of those strong desires and predilections i had known on my wedding trip what a joy it would have been to build then but now i found myself wholly lacking in definite ideas as to style and construction secretly i looked forward to certain luxuries such as a bedroom and dressing-room and warm tiled bathroom all to myself bachelor privacies for which i had longed two mornings later at the breakfast-table maude asked me if i had thought of an architect why archie lamerton i suppose who else is there have you anyone else in mind no said maude but i heard of such a clever man in boston who doesn't charge mr lamerton's prices and who designs such beautiful private houses but we can afford to pay lamerton's prices i replied smiling and why shouldn't we have the best are you sure he is the best hugh everybody has him i said maude smiled in return i suppose that's a good reason she answered of course it's a good reason i assured her these people the people we know wouldn't have had lamerton unless he was satisfactory what's the matter with his houses well said maud they're not very original i don't say they're not good in a way but they lack a certain imagination it's difficult for me to express what i mean machine made isn't precisely the idea but there should be a certain irregularity in art shouldn't there i saw a reproduction in one of the architectural journals of a house in boston by a man named frey that seemed to me to have great charm here was lucia unmistakably that's all very well i said impatiently but when one has to live in a house one wants something more than artistic irregularity lamerton knows how to build for everyday existence he's a practical man as well as a man of taste he may not be a christopher wren but he understands conveniences and comforts his chimneys don't smoke his windows are tight he knows what systems of heating are the best and whom to go to he knows what good plumbing is i'm rather surprised you don't appreciate that maud you're so particular as to what kind of rooms the children shall have and you want a schoolroom nursery with all the latest devices with sun and ventilation the Beringers wouldn't have had him the hollisters and dickinsons wouldn't have had him if his work lacked taste and nancy wouldn't have had him added maud and she smiled once more well i haven't consulted nancy or anyone else i replied a little tartly perhaps you don't seem to realize that some fashions may have a basis of reason they are not all silly as lucia seems to think if lamerton builds satisfactory houses he ought to be forgiven for being the fashion he ought to have a chance i got up to leave let's see what kind of a plan he'll draw up at any rate her glance was almost indulgent of course you i want you to be satisfied to be pleased she said and you i questioned you are to live in the house more than i oh i'm sure it will turn out all right she replied now you'd better run along i know you're late i am late i admitted rather lamely if you don't care for lamerton's drawings we'll get another architect several years before mr lamerton had arrived among us with a beau arts moustache and letters of introduction to mrs durrett and others we found him the most adaptable the most accommodating of young men always ready to donate his talents and his services to private theatricals tableaux and fancy dress balls to take a place at a table at the last moment one of his most appealing attributes was his belief in our city a form of patriotism that culminated in later years in million population clubs i have often heard him declare when the ladies had left the dining-room that there was positively no limit to our future growth 
and incidentally to our future wealth such sentiments as these could not fail to add to any man's popularity and his success was a foregone conclusion almost before we knew it he was building the new union station of which he had foreseen the need to take care of the millions to which our populations was to be swelled building the new post office that the unceasing efforts of theodore watling finally procured for us building indeed nancy's new house the largest of our private mansions save mr scherer's a commission that had immediately brought about others from the dickinsons and the Barringers. that very day i called on him in his offices at the top of one of our new buildings where many young draughtsmen were bending over their boards i was ushered into his private studio i suppose you want something handsome hugh he said looking at me over his cigarette something commensurate with these fees i hear you are getting well i want to be comfortable i admitted we lunched at the club together where we talked over the requirements when he came to dinner the next week and spread out his sketch on the living-room table maude drew in her breath why hugh she exclaimed in dismay it's as big as as big as the white house not quite i answered laughing with archie we may as well take our ease in our old age take our ease echoed maud we'll rattle round in it i'll never get used to it after a month mrs parrott i'll wager you'll be wondering how you ever got along without it said archie it was not as big as the white house yet it could not be called small i had seen to that the long facade was imposing dignified with a touch of conventionality and solidity in keeping with my standing in the city it was georgian of plum-coloured brick with marble trimmings and marble wedges over the ample windows some years later i saw the house by ferguson of new york from which archie had cribbed it at one end off the dining-room was a semicircular conservatory there was a small portico with marble pillars and in the ample swift sloping roof many dormers servants rooms archie explained the look of anxiety on maud's face deepened as he went over the floor plans the reception room dining room to seat thirty the servants hall and upstairs maud's room boudoir and bath and dress closet my apartments adjoining on one side and the children's on the other and the guest rooms with baths maud surrendered as one who gives way to the inevitable when the actual building began we both of us experienced i think a certain mild excitement and walked out there sometimes with the children in the spring evenings and on sunday afternoons excitement is perhaps too strong a word for my feelings there was a pleasurable anticipation on my part a looking forward to a more decorous a more luxurious existence a certain impatience at the delays inevitable in building but a new legal commercial enterprise of magnitude began to absorb me at this time and somehow the building of this home the first that we possessed was not the event it should have been there were moments when i felt cheated when i wondered what had become of that capacity for enjoyment which in my youth had been so keen i remembered indeed one grey evening when i went there alone after the workmen had departed and stood in the litter of mortar and bricks and boards gazing at the completed front of the house it was even larger than i had imagined it from the plans in the summer twilight there was an air about it if not precisely menacing at least portentous with its gaping windows and towering roof i was a little tired from a hard day I had the odd feeling of having raised up something which, momentarily at least, I doubted my ability to cope, something huge, impersonal, something that ought to have represented a fireside, a sanctuary, and yet was the embodiment of an element quite alien to the home, a restless element with which our American atmosphere had, by invisible degrees, become charged as i stared at it the odd fancy seized me 
that the building somehow typified my own career i had gained something in truth but had i not also missed something something a different home would have embodied maude and the children had gone to the seaside with a vague uneasiness i turned away from the contemplation of those walls the companion mansions were closed their blinds tightly drawn the neighbourhood was as quiet as the country save for a slight but persistent noise that impressed itself on my consciousness i walked around the house to spy in the back yard a young girl rather stealthily gathering lathes and fragments of joists and flooring and loading them into a child's express wagon she started when she saw me she was little more than a child and the loose calico dress she wore seemed to emphasize her thinness she stood stock still staring at me with frightened yet defiant eyes i too felt a strange timidity in her presence why do you stop i asked at length say is this your heap she demanded i acknowledged it a hint of awe widened her eyes then she glanced at the half-filled wagon this stuff ain't no use to you is it no i'm glad to have you take it she shifted to the other foot but did not continue her gathering an impulse seized me i put down my walking-stick and began picking up pieces of wood flinging them into the wagon i looked at her again rather furtively she had not moved her attitude puzzled me for it was one neither of surprise nor of protest the spectacle of the millionaire owner of the house engaged in this menial occupation gave her no thrills i finished the loading there i said and drew a dollar bill out of my pocket and gave it to her even then she did not thank me but took up the wagon tongue and went off leaving on me a disheartening impression of numbness of life crushed out i glanced up once more at the mansion i had built for myself looming in the dusk and walked hurriedly away one afternoon some three weeks after we had moved into the new house i came out of the club where i had been lunching in conference with scherer and two capitalists from new york it was after four o'clock the day was fading the street lamps were beginning to cast sickly streaks of jade-coloured light across the slush of the pavements it was the sight of this slush which for a brief half-hour that morning had been pure snow and had sent matthew and morton and biddy into ecstasies at the notion of a real christmas that brought to my mind the imminence of the festival and the fact that i had as yet bought no presents such was the predicament in which i usually found myself on christmas eve and it was not without a certain sense of annoyance at the task thus abruptly confronting me that i got into my automobile and directed the chauffeur to the shopping district the crowds surged along the wet sidewalks and overflowed into the street and over the heads of the people i stared at the blazing shop windows decked out in christmas greens my chauffeur a bristly-haired parisian blew his horn insolently men and women jostled each other to get out of the way their holiday mood giving place to resentment as they stared into the windows of the limousine with the american inability to sit still i shifted from one corner of the seat to another impatient at the slow progress of the machine and i felt a certain contempt for human beings that they should make all this fuss burden themselves with all these senseless purchases for a tradition the automobile stopped and i fought my way across the sidewalk into the store of that time-honoured firm elgin yates and garner pausing uncertainly before the very counter where some ten years before i had bought an engagement ring young mr garner himself spied me and handing over a customer to a tired clerk hurried forward to greet me 
his manner implying that my entrance was some sort of an event i had become used to this aroma of deference what can i show you mr parrot he asked i don't know i'm looking around i said vaguely bewildered by the glittering baubles by which i was confronted what did maude want while i was gazing into the case mr garner opened a safe behind him laying before me a large sapphire set with diamonds in a platinum brooch a beautiful stone in the depths of it gleaming a fire like a star in an arctic sky i had not given maude anything of value of late decidedly this was of value mr garner named the price glibly if mrs parrot didn't care for it it might be brought back or exchanged i took it with a sigh of relief leaving the store i paused on the edge of the rushing stream of humanity with the problem of the children's gifts still to be solved i thought of my own childhood when at christmas tide i had walked with my mother up and down this very street so changed and modernized now recalling that i had had definite desires desperate ones but my imagination failed me when i tried to summon up the emotions connected with them i had no desires now i could buy anything in reason in the whole street what did matthew and morton want and little biddy maude had not spoiled them but they didn't seem to have any definite wants the children made me think with a sudden softening of tom peters and i went into a tobacconist and bought him a box of expensive cigars then i told the chauffeur to take me to a toy shop where i stood staring through a plate-glass window at the elaborate playthings devised for the modern children of luxury in the centre was a toy man-of-war three feet in length with turrets and guns and propellers and a real steam engine as a boy i should have dreamed about it schemed for it bartered my immortal soul for it but if i gave it to matthew what was there for morton a steam locomotive caught my eye almost as elaborate forcing my way through the doors i captured a salesman and from a state bordering on nervous collapse he became galvanized into an intense alertness and respect when he understood my desires he didn't know the price of the objects in question he brought the proprietor an obsequious little german who on learning my name repeated it in every sentence for biddy i chose a doll that was all but human when held by a young woman for my inspection it elicited murmurs of admiration from the women shoppers by whom we were surrounded the proprietor promised to make a special delivery of the three articles before seven o'clock presently the automobile after speeding up the asphalt of grant avenue stopped before the new house in spite of the change that house had made in my life in three weeks i had become amazingly used to it yet i had an odd feeling that christmas eve as i stood under the portico with my key in the door the same feeling of the impersonality of the place which i had experienced before not that for one moment i would have exchanged it for the smaller house we had left i opened the door how often in that other house i had come in the evening seeking quiet my brain occupied with a problem only to be annoyed by the romping of the children on the landing above a noise in one end of it echoed to the other but here as i entered the hall all was quiet a dignified deep carpeted stairway swept upward before me and on either side were wide empty rooms and in the subdued light of one of them i saw a dark figure moving silently about the butler he came forward to relieve me deftly of my hat and overcoat well i had it at last this establishment to which i had for so long looked forward 
and yet that evening as i hesitated in the hall i somehow was unable to grasp that it was real and permanent the very solidity of the walls and doors paradoxically suggested transientness the butler a flitting ghost how still the place was almost oppressively still i recalled oddly a story of a peasant who yearning for the great life had stumbled upon an empty palace its tables set with food in golden dishes before two days had passed he had fled from it in horror back to his crowded cottage and his drudgery in the fields never once had the sense of possession of the palace been realized nor did i feel that i possessed this house though i had the deeds of it in my safe and the receipted bills in my files it eluded me seemed in my bizarre mood of that evening almost to mock me you have built me it seemed to say but i am stronger than you because you have not earned me ridiculous when the years of my labor and the size of my bank account were considered such however is the verbal expression of my feeling was the house empty after all had something happened with a slight panicky sensation i climbed the stairs with their endless shallow treads to hurry through the silent hallway to the schoolroom reassuring noises came faintly through the heavy door i opened it little biddy was careening round and round crying out to-morrow's christmas santa claus is coming to-night matthew was regarding her indulgently sympathetically morton rather scornfully the myth had been exploded for both but matthew still hugged it that was the difference between them maud seated on the floor perceived me first and glanced up at me with a smile it's father she said biddy stopped in the midst of a pirouette at the age of seven she was still shy with me and retreated towards maud aren't we going to have a tree father demanded morton aggressively mother won't tell me neither will miss allsop miss allsop was their governess why do you want a tree i asked oh for biddy he said it wouldn't be christmas without a tree matthew declared and santa claus he added for his sister's benefit perhaps santa claus when he sees we've got this big house will think we don't need anything and go to some poorer children said maud you wouldn't blame him if he did that would you the response to this appeal cannot be said to have been enthusiastic after dinner when at last all of them were in bed we dressed the tree it might better be said that maud and miss allsop dressed it while i gave a perfunctory aid both the women took such a joy in the process vying with each other in getting effects and as i watched them eagerly draping the tinsel and pinning on the glittering ornaments i wondered why it was that i was unable to find the same joy as they thus it had been every christmas eve i was always tired when i got home and after dinner relaxation set in an electrician had come while we were at the table and had fastened on the little electric bulbs which did duty as candles oh said maud as she stood off to survey the effect isn't it beautiful come miss allsop let's get the presents they flew out of the room and presently hurried back with their arms full of the usual parcels parcels from maud's family in elkington from my own relatives from the blackwoods and the peters from nancy in the meantime i had had my own contributions brought up the man of war the locomotive the big doll maud stood staring hugh they'll be utterly ruined she exclaimed the boys might as well have something instructive i replied and as for biddy nothing's too good for her i might have known you wouldn't forget them although you are so busy we filled the three stockings hung by the great fireplace 
then with a last lingering look at the brightness of the tree she stood in the doorway and turned the electric switch not before seven to-morrow morning miss allsop she said hugh you will get up won't you you mustn't miss seeing them you can go back to bed again i promised evidently this was reality to maud and had it not been one of my dreams of marriage this prepping for the children's christmas remembering the fierce desires of my own childhood it struck me after i had kissed her good-night and retired to my dressing-room that fierce desires burned within me still but the objects towards which their flames leaped out differed that was all had i remained a child since my idea of pleasure was still that of youth the craving for excitement adventure was still unslaked the craving for freedom as keen as ever during the whole of my married life i had been conscious of an inner protest against settling down as tom peters had settled down the smaller house from which we had moved with its enforced propinquity had emphasized the bondage of marriage now i had two rooms to myself in the undisputed possession of which i had taken a puerile delight on one side of my dressing-room archie lamerton had provided a huge closet containing the latest devices for the keeping of a multitudinous wardrobe there was a reading lamp and the easiest of easy chairs imported from england while between the windows were shelves of italian walnut which i had filled with the books i had bought while at cambridge and had never since opened as i sank down in my chair that odd feeling of uneasiness of transience and unreality of unsatisfaction i had had ever since we had moved suddenly became intensified and at the very moment when i had gained everything i had once believed a man could desire i was successful i was rich my health had not failed i had a wife who catered to my wishes lovable children who gave no trouble and yet there was still the void to be filled the old void i had felt as a boy the longing for something beyond me i knew not what there was the strange inability to taste any of these things the need at every turn for excitement for a stimulus my marriage had been a disappointment though i strove to conceal this from myself a disappointment because it had not filled the requirements of my category excitement and mystery i had provided the setting and lacked the happiness another woman nancy might have given me the needed stimulation and yet my thoughts did not dwell on nancy that night my longings were not directed toward her but towards the vision of a calm contented married happiness i had looked forward to in my youth a vision suddenly presented once more by the sight of maud's simple pleasure in dressing the christmas tree what restless fiendish element in me prevented my enjoying that i had something of the fearful feeling of a ghost in my own house and among my own family of a spirit doomed to wander unable to share in what should have been my own in what would have saved me were i able to partake of it was it too late to make that effort presently the strains of music pervaded my consciousness the chimes of trinity ringing out in the damp night the christmas hymn adeste fidelis it was midnight it was christmas how clear the notes rang through the wet air that came in at my window back into the dim centuries that music led me into candlelit gothic chapels of monasteries on wind-swept heights above the firs and cathedrals in medieval cities twilight ages of war and scourge and stress and storm and faith o oh, come all ye faithful what a strange thing that faith whose flame so marvellously persisted piercing the gloom the christmas myth as i had heard someone once call it did it possess the power to save me save me from what 
ah in this hour i knew in the darkness the danger loomed up before me vague yet terrible and i trembled why was not this thing ever present to chasten and sober me the thing was myself into my remembrance by what suggestion i know not came that march evening when i had gone to holder chapel at harvard to listen to a preacher a personality whose fame and influence had since spread throughout the land some dim fear had possessed me then i recalled vividly the man and the face of herman krebs as i drew back from the doorway when i awoke my disquieting retrospective mood had disappeared and yet there clung to me minus the sanction of fear or reward or revealed truth a certain determination to behave on this day at least more like a father and a husband to make an effort to enter into the spirit of the festival and see what happened i dressed in cheerful haste took the sapphire pendant from its velvet box tiptoed into the still silent schoolroom and hung it on the tree flooding on the electric light that set the tinsel and globes ablaze no sooner had i done this than i heard the patter of feet in the hallway and a high-pitched voice biddy's crying out it's santa claus three small flannel wrapped figures stood in the doorway why it's father exclaimed morton and he's all dressed said matthew oh cried biddy staring at the blazing tree isn't it beautiful maud was close behind them she gave an exclamation of delighted surprise when she saw me and then stood gazing with shining eyes at the children especially at biddy who stood dazzled by the glory of the constellation confronting her matthew too wished to prolong the moment of mystery it was practical morton who cried let's see what we've got the assault and the sacking began i couldn't help thinking as i watched them of my own wildly riotous christmas morning sensations when all the gifts had worn the aura of the supernatural but the arrival of these toys was looked upon by my children as a part of the natural order of the universe at maud's suggestion the night before we had placed my presence piece de resistance at a distance from the tree in the hope that they would not be spied at once that they would be in some sort a climax it was matthew who first perceived the ship and identified it by the card as his property to him it was clearly wonderful but no miracle he did not cry out or call the attention of the others to it but stood with his feet apart examining it his first remark being a query as to why it didn't fly the american flag its ensign was british then morton saw the locomotive was told that it was his and took possession of it violently why wasn't there more track wouldn't i get more track i explained that it would go by steam and he began unscrewing the cap on the little boiler until he was distracted by the man-o-war and with natural acquisitiveness started to take possession of that biddy was bewildered by the doll which maud had taken up and was holding in her lap she had had talking dolls before and dolls that closed their eyes she recognized this one indeed as a sort of super doll but her little mind was modern too and set no limits on what might be accomplished she patted it but was more impressed by the raptures of miss allsop who had come in and was admiring it with some extravagance suddenly the child caught sight of her stocking until now forgotten and darted for the fireplace i turned to maud who stood beside me watching them but you haven't looked on the tree yourself i reminded her she gave me an odd questioning glance and got up and set down the doll as she stood for a moment gazing at the lights she seemed very girlish in her dressing gown with her hair in two long plaits down her back oh hugh 
she lifted the pendant from the branch and held it up her gratitude her joy at receiving a present was deeper than the children's you chose it for me i felt something like a pang when i thought how little trouble it had been if you don't like it i said or wish to have it changed changed she exclaimed reproachfully do you think i'd change it only it's much too valuable i smiled miss allsop deftly undid the clasp and hung it around maud's neck how it suits you mrs parrot she cried this pendant was by no means the only present i had given maud in recent years and though she cared as little for jewels as for dress she seemed to attach to it a peculiar value and significance that disturbed and smote me for the incident had revealed a love unchanged and unchangeable had she taken my gift as a sign that my indifference was melting as i went downstairs and into the library to read the financial page of the morning newspaper i asked myself with a certain disquiet whether in the formal complicated and luxurious conditions in which we now lived it might be possible to build up new ties and common interests i reflected that this would involve confessions and confidences on my part since there was a whole side of my life of which maud knew nothing i had convinced myself long ago that a man's business career was no affair of his wife's i had justified that career to myself yet i had always had a vague feeling that maud had she known the details would not have approved of it impossible indeed for a woman to grasp these problems they were outside of her experience nevertheless something might be done to improve our relationship something which would relieve me of that uneasy lack of unity i felt when at home of the lassitude and ennui i was wont to feel creeping over me on sundays and holidays End of section 22section 23 of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book three chapter twenty i find in relating those parts of my experience that seem to be of most significance i have neglected to tell of my mother's death which occurred the year before we moved to grant avenue she had clung the rest of her days to the house in which i had been born of late years she had lived in my children and maud's devotion to her had been unflagging truth compels me to say that she had long ceased to be a factor in my life i have thought of her in later years coincident with the unexpected feeling of fruitlessness that came to me with the grant avenue house of things achieved but not realized or appreciated was the appearance of a cloud on the business horizon or rather on the political horizon since it is hard to separate the two realms there were signs for those who could read of a rising popular storm during the earliest years of the new century the political atmosphere had changed the public had shown a tendency to grow restless and everybody knows how important it is for financial operations for prosperity that the people should mind their own business in short our commercial romantic pilgrimage began to meet with unexpected resistance it was as though the nation were entering into a senseless conspiracy to kill prosperity in the first place in regard to the presidency of the united states a cog had unwittingly been slipped it had always been recognized as i have said by responsible financial personages that the impulses of the majority of americans could not be trusted 
that these who had inherited illusions of freedom must be governed firmly yet with delicacy unknown to them their presidents must be chosen for them precisely as mr watling had been chosen for the people of our state and the popular enthusiasm manufactured later there were informal meetings in new york in washington where candidates were discussed not that such and such a man was settled upon it was a process of elimination usually the affair had gone smoothly for instance a while before a benevolent capitalist of the middle west an intimate of adolf scherer had become obsessed with the idea that a friend of his was the safest and sanest man for the head of the nation had convinced his fellow capitalist of this whereupon he had gone ahead to spend his energy and his money freely to secure the nomination and election of this gentleman the republican national committee the republican national convention were allowed to squabble to their hearts content as to whether smith jones or brown should be nominated but it was clearly understood that if robinson or white were chosen there would be no corporation campaign funds this applied also to the democratic party on the rare occasions when it seemed to have an opportunity of winning now however through an unpardonable blunder there had got into the white house a president who was inclined to ignore advice who appealed over the heads of the advisers to the populace who went about tilting at the industrial structures we had so painfully wrought and in frequent blasts of presidential messages enunciated new and heretical doctrines who attacked the railroads encouraged the brazen treason of labor unions inspired an army of muckrakers to fill the magazines with the wildest and most violent of language state legislatures were emboldened to pass mischievous and restrictive laws and much of my time began to be occupied in inducing by various means our courts to declare these unconstitutional how we sighed for a business man or a lawyer in the white house the country had gone mad the stock market trembled the cry of corporation control resounded everywhere and everywhere demagogues arose to inaugurate reform campaigns in an abortive attempt to clean up politics down with the bosses who were the tools of the corporations in our own city which we fondly believe to be proof against the prevailing madness a slight epidemic occurred slight yet momentarily alarming accidents will happen even in the best regulated political organizations and accidents in these days appeared to be the rule a certain mr edgar greenhalge a middle-aged mild-mannered and inoffensive man who had made a moderate fortune in wholesale drugs was elected to the school board later on some of us had reason to suspect that perry blackwood with more astuteness than he had been given credit for was responsible for mr greenhalge's candidacy at any rate he was not a man to oppose and in his previous life had given no hint that he might become a troublemaker nothing happened for several months but one day on which i had occasion to interview mr jason on a little matter of handing over to the railroad a piece of land belonging to the city which was known as billings bowl he inferred that mr greenhalge might prove a disturber of that profound peace with which the city administration had for many years been blessed who the hell is he was mr jason's question it appeared that mr g s private life had been investigated with disappointingly barren results he was seemingly an anomalistic being in our nietzschean age an unaggressive man he had never sold any drugs to the city 
he was not a church member nor could it be learned that he had ever wandered into those byways of the town where mr jason might easily have got trace of him if he had any vices he kept them locked up in a safe deposit box that could not be located he was very genial and had a way of conveying disturbing facts when he wished to convey them under cover of the most amusing stories mr jason was not a man to get panicky green howledge could be handled all right only what was there in it for green howledge a nut difficult for mr jason to crack the two other members of the school board were solid here again the wisest of men was proved to err for mr greenhalge turned out to have powers of persuasion he made what in religious terms would have been called a conversion in the case of another member of the board and hitherto staunch old reprobate by the name of muller an ex-saloon keeper in comfortable circumstances to whom the idea of public office had appealed mr greenhalge having got wind of certain transactions that interested him extremely brought them in his good-natured way to the knowledge of mr gregory the district attorney suggesting that he investigate mr gregory smiled undertook as delicately as possible to convey to mr greenhalge the ways of the world and of the political world in particular wherein it seemed every one was a good fellow mr greenhalge was evidently a good fellow and didn't want to make trouble over little things no mr greenhalge didn't want to make trouble he appreciated a comfortable life as much as mr gregory he told the district attorney a funny story which might or might not have had an application to the affair and took his leave with the remark that he had been happy to make mr gregory's acquaintance on his departure the district attorney's countenance changed he severely rebuked a subordinate for some trivial mistake and walked as rapidly as he could carry his considerable weight to monahan's saloon one of the things mr gregory had pointed out incidentally was that mr greenhalge's evidence was vague and that a grand jury wanted facts which might be difficult to obtain mr greenhalge thinking over the suggestion sent for krebs in the course of a month or two the investigation was accomplished greenhalge went back to gregory who repeated his homilies whereupon he was handed a hundred or so typewritten pages of evidence it was a dramatic moment mr gregory resorted to pleading he was sure that mr greenhalge didn't want to be disagreeable it was true and unfortunate that such things were so but they would be amended he promised all his influence to amend them the public conscience said mr gregory was being aroused now how much better for the party for the reputation the fair name of the city if these things could be corrected quietly and nobody indicted or tried between sensible and humane men wasn't that the obvious way after the election suit could be brought to recover the money but mr greenhalge appeared to be one of those hopeless individuals without a spark of party loyalty he merely continued to smile and to suggest that the district attorney prosecute mr gregory temporized and presently left the city on a vacation a day or two after his second visit to the district attorney's office mr greenhalge had a call from the city auditor and the purchasing agent who talked about their families which was very painful it was also intimated to mr greenhalge by others who accosted him that he was just the man for mayor he smiled and modestly belittled his qualifications suddenly one fine morning a part of the evidence krebs had gathered appeared in the columns of the mail and state 
a new and enterprising newspaper for which the growth and prosperity of our city were responsible the sort of revelations that stirred to amazement and wrath innocent citizens of nearly every city in our country politics and graft infesting our entire educational system teachers and janitors levied upon prices that took the breath away paid to favored firms for supplies specifications so worded that reasonable bids were barred the respectable firm of ellery and knowles was involved in spite of our horror we were americans and saw the humour of the situation and laughed at the caricature in the mail and state representing a scholar holding up a pencil and a legend under it no it's not gold but it ought to be here i must enter into a little secret history any affair that threatened the integrity of mr jason's organization was of serious moment to the gentlemen of the financial world who found that organization invaluable and who were also concerned about the fair name of their community a conference in the boyne club decided that the city officials were being persecuted and entitled therefore to the very best of counsel in this instance mr hugh parrott it was also thought wise by mr dickinson mr gorse and mr grierson and by mr parrott himself that he should not appear in the matter an aspiring young attorney mr arbuthnot was retained to conduct the case in public thus capital came to the assistance of mr jason a fund was raised and i was given carte blanche to defend the miserable city auditor and purchasing agent both of whom elicited my sympathy for they were stout men and rapidly losing weight our first care was to create a delay in the trial of the case in order to give the public excitement a chance to die down for the public is proverbially unable to fix its attention for long on one object continually demanding the distraction that our newspapers make it their business to supply fortunately a murder was committed in one of our suburbs creating a mystery that filled the extras for some weeks and this was opportunely followed by the embezzlement of a considerable sum by the cashier of one of our state banks public interest was divided between baseball and the tracking of this criminal to new zealand our resentment was directed not so much against commissioner greenhalge as against krebs it is curious how keen is the instinct of men like grierson dickinson talent and scherer for the really dangerous opponent who the deuce was this man krebs well i could supply them with some information they doubtless recalled the galligan case and miller gorse who forgot nothing also remembered his opposition in the legislature to house bill seven o nine he had continued to be the obscure legal champion of oppressed labour but how he had managed to keep body and soul together i knew not i had encountered him occasionally in court corridors or on the street he did not seem to change much nor did he appear in our brief and perfunctory conversations to bear any resentment against me for the part i had taken in the galligan affair i avoided him when it was possible i had to admit that he had done a remarkably good piece of work in collecting greenhalge's evidence and how the erring city officials were to be rescued became a matter of serious concern gregory the district attorney was in an abject funk in any case a mediocre lawyer after the indictment he was no help at all i had to do all the work and after we had selected the particular railroad judge before whom the case was to be tried i talked it over with him his name was nodding he understood perfectly what was required of him and that he was for the moment the chief bulwark on which depended the logical interests of capital and sane government for their defence 
also his re-election was at stake it was indicated to newspapers such as the mail and state showing a desire to keep up public interest in the affair that their advertising matter might decrease mr sherrill's great department store for instance did not approve of this sort of agitation certain stationers booksellers and other business men had got cold feet as mr jason put it the prospect of bankruptcy suddenly looming ahead of them since the corn national bank held certain paper in short when the case did come to trial it blew up as one of our ward leaders dynamically expressed it several important witnesses were mysteriously lacking and two or three school teachers had suddenly decided to take a trip to europe the district attorney was ill and assigned the prosecution to a mild assistant while a sceptical jury composed largely of gentlemen who had the business interests of the community and of themselves at heart returned a verdict of not guilty this was the signal for severely dignified editorials in mr tallant's and other conservative newspapers hinting that it might be well in the future for all well-meaning but misguided reformers to think twice before subjecting the city to the cost of such trials and uselessly attempting to inflame public opinion and upset legitimate business the era expressed the opinion that no city in the united states was more efficiently and economically governed than our own irregularities might well occur in every large organization and it would better have become mr greenholge if instead of hiring an unknown lawyer thirsting for notoriety to cook up charges he had called the attention of the proper officials to the matter etc etc the pilot alone which relied on sensation for its circulation kept hammering away for a time with veiled accusations but our citizens had become weary as a topic however this effective suppression of reform was referred to with some delicacy by my friends and myself our interference had been necessary and therefore justified but we were not particularly proud of it and our triumph had a temporarily sobering effect it was about this time if i remember correctly that mr dickinson gave the beautiful stained glass window to the church months passed one day having occasion to go over to the boyne ironworks to get information at first hand from certain officials and having finished my business i boarded a south side electric car standing at the terminal just before it started krebs came down the aisle of the car and took the seat in front of me well i said how are you he turned in surprise and thrust his big bony hand across the back of the seat come and sit here he came do you ever get back to cambridge in these days i asked cordially not since i graduated from newspaper work in boston that's a good many years ago by the way our old landlady died this year do you mean granite face i was about to say i had forgotten her name but that homesick scene when tom and i stood before our open trunks when krebs had paid us a visit came back to me you've kept in touch with her i asked in surprise well said krebs she was one of the few friends i had at cambridge i had a letter from the daughter last week she's done very well and is an instructor in biology in one of the western universities i was silent a moment and you you never married did you i inquired somewhat irrelevantly his semi-humorous gesture seemed to deny that such a luxury was for him the conversation dragged a little i began to feel the curiosity he invariably inspired what was his life what were his beliefs and i was possessed by a certain militancy a desire to smoke him out 
i did not stop to reflect that mine was in reality a defensive rather than an aggressive attitude do you live down here in this part of the city i asked no he boarded in fowler street i knew it as in a district given over to the small houses of working men i suppose you are still a socialist i suppose i am he admitted and added at any rate that is as near as you can get to it isn't it fairly definite fairly if my notions are taken in general as the antithesis of what you fellows believe the abolition of property for instance the abolition of too much property what do you mean by too much when it ceases to be real to a man when it represents more than his need when it drives him and he becomes a slave to it involuntarily i thought of my new house not a soothing reflection but who is going to decree how much property a man should have nobody everybody that will gradually tend to work itself out as we become more sensible and better educated and understand more clearly what is good for us i retorted with the stock common-sense phrase if we had a division to-morrow within a few years or so the most efficient would contrive to get the bulk of it back in their hands that's so he admitted but we're not going to have a division to-morrow thank god i exclaimed he regarded me the efficient will have to die or be educated first that will take time educated parrot have you ever read any serious books on what you call socialism he asked i threw out an impatient negative i was going on to protest that i was not ignorant of the doctrine oh what you call socialism is merely what you believe to be more or less crude and utopian propaganda of an obscure political party that isn't socialism nor is the anomalistic attempt that the christian socialists make to unite modern socialistic philosophy with christian orthodoxy socialism what is socialism then i demanded somewhat defiantly let's call it education science he said smilingly economics and government based on human needs and a rational view of religion it has been taught in german universities and it will be taught in ours whenever we shall succeed in inducing your friends by one means or another not to continue endowing them socialism in the proper sense is merely the application of modern science to government i was puzzled and angry what he said made sense somehow but it sounded to me like so much gibberish but germany is a monarchy i objected it is a modern scientific system with monarchy as its superstructure it is anomalous but frank the monarchy is there for all men to see and some day it will be done away with we are supposedly a democracy and our superstructure is plutocratic our people feel the burden but they have not yet discovered what the burden is and when they do i asked a little defiantly when they do replied krebs they will set about making the plutocrats happy now plutocrats are discontented and never satisfied the more they get the more they want the more they are troubled by what other people have i smiled in spite of myself your interest in in plutocrats is charitable then why yes he said my interest in all kinds of people is charitable however improbable it may seem i have no reason to dislike or envy people who have more than they know what to do with and the worst of it was he looked it he managed somehow simply by sitting there with his strange eyes fixed upon me in spite of his ridiculous philosophy 
to belittle my ambitions to make of small worth my achievements to bring home to me the fact that in spite of these i was neither contented nor happy though he kept his humour and his poise he implied an experience that was far deeper more tragic and more significant than mine i was goaded into making an injudicious remark well your campaign against ennerly and jackson fell through didn't it ennerly and jackson were the city officials who had been tried it wasn't a campaign against them he answered and considering the subordinate part i took in it it could scarcely be called mine greenhold turned to you to get the evidence well i got it he said what became of it you ought to know what do you mean just what i say parrot he answered slowly you ought to know if any one knows i considered this a moment more soberly i thought i might have counted on my fingers the number of men cognizant of my connection with the case i decided that he was guessing i think you should explain that i told him the time may come when you'll have to explain it is that a threat i demanded a threat he repeated not at all but you are accusing me of what he interrupted suddenly he had made it necessary for me to define the nature of his charges of having some connection with the affair in question whatever else i may be i'm not a fool he said quietly neither the district attorney's office nor young arbuthnot had brains enough to get them out of that scrape jason didn't have influence enough with the judiciary and as i happen to know there was a good deal of money spent you may be called upon to prove it i retorted rather hotly so i may his tone far from being defiant had in it a note of sadness i looked at him what were his potentialities was it not just possible that i should have to revise my idea of him acknowledge that he might become more formidable than i had thought there was an awkward silence you mustn't imagine parrot that i have any personal animus against you or against any of the men with whom you're associated he went on after a moment i'm sorry you're on that side that's all i told you so once before i'm not calling you names I'm not talking about morality and immorality immorality when you come down to it is often just the opposition to progress that comes from blindness i don't make the mistake of blaming a few individuals for the evils of modern industrial society and on the other hand you mustn't blame individuals for the discomforts of what you call the reform movement for that movement is merely a symptom a symptom of a disease due to a change in the structure of society we'll never have any happiness or real prosperity until we cure that disease i was inclined to blame you once at the capital that time because it seemed to me that a man with all the advantages you have had and a mind like yours didn't have much excuse but i've thought about it since i realize now that i've had a good many more advantages than you and to tell you the truth i don't see how you could have come out anywhere else than where you are all your surroundings and training were against it that doesn't mean that you won't grasp the situation some day i have an idea you will it's just an idea the man who ought to be condemned isn't the man that doesn't understand what's going on but the man who comes to understand and persists in opposing it he rose and looked down at me with the queer disturbing smile i remembered i get off at this corner he added rather diffidently i hope you'll forgive me for being personal i didn't mean to be but you rather forced it on me oh that's all right i replied the car stopped and he hurried off i watched his tall figure as it disappeared among the crowd on the sidewalk 
i returned to my office in one of those moods that are the more disagreeable because conflicting to-day in particular i had been aroused by what tom used to call krebs crust and as i sat at my desk warm waves of resentment went through me at the very notion of his telling me that my view was limited and that therefore my professional conduct was to be forgiven it was he the fanatic who saw things in the larger scale an assumption the more exasperating because at the moment he made it he almost convinced me that he did and i was unable to achieve for him the measure of contempt i desired for the incident the measure of ridicule it deserved my real animus was due to the fact that he had managed to shake my self-confidence to take the flavour out of my achievements a flavour that was in the course of an hour to be completely restored by one of those interesting coincidences occasionally occurring in life a young member of my staff entered with a telegram i tore it open and sat staring at it a moment before i realized that it brought me the greatest honor of my career the banker personality in new york had summoned me for consultation to be recognized by him conferred indeed an ennoblement the star and garter so to speak of the only great realm in america that of high finance and the yellow piece of paper i held in my hand instantly remagnetized me renewed my energy and i hurried home to pack my bag in order to catch the seven o'clock train i announced the news to maude i imagine it's because he knows i have made something of a study of the coal roads situation i added i'm glad hugh she said i suppose it's a great compliment never had her inadequacy to appreciate my career been more apparent i looked at her curiously to realize once more with peculiar sharpness how far we were apart but now the resolutions i had made and never carried out on that first christmas in the new home were lacking indeed it was the futility of such resolutions that struck me at this moment if her manner had been merely one of indifference it would in a way have been easier to bear she was simply incapable of grasping the significance of the event the meaning to me of the years of unceasing ambitious effort it crowned yes it is something of a recognition i replied is there anything i can get for you in new york i don't know how long i shall have to stay i'll telegraph you when i'm getting back i kissed her and hurried out to the automobile as i drove off i saw her still standing in the doorway looking after me in the station i had a few minutes to telephone nancy if you don't see me for a few days it's because i've gone to new york i informed her something important i'm sure how did you guess i demanded and heard her laugh come back soon and tell me about it she said and i walked exhilarated to the train as i sped through the night staring out of the window and into the darkness i reflected on the man i was going to see but at that time although he represented to me the quintessence of achievement and power i did not by any means grasp the many-sided significance of the phenomenon he presented though i was keenly aware of his influence and that men spoke of him with bated breath presidents came and went kings and emperors had responsibilities and were subject daily to annoyances but this man was a law unto himself he did exactly what he chose and compelled other men to do it wherever commerce reigned and where did it not he was king and head of its holy empire pope and emperor at once for he had his code of ethics his religion and those who rebelled who failed to conform he excommunicated a code something like the map of europe apparently inconsistent in places 
what i did not then comprehend was that he was the american principle personified the supreme individual assertion of the conviction that government should remain modestly in the background while the efficient acquired the supremacy that was theirs by natural right nor had i grasped at that time the crowning achievement of a unity that fused christianity with those acquisitive dispositions said to be inherent in humanity in him the lion and the lamb the eagle and the dove dwelt together in amity and power new york always a congenial place to gentlemen of vitality and means and influential connections had never appeared to me more sparkling more inspiring winter had relented spring had not as yet begun and as i sat in a corner of the dining-room of my hotel looking out on the sunlit avenue i was conscious of partaking of the vigour and confidence of the well-dressed clear-eyed people who walked or drove past my window with the air of a conquering race what else was there in the world more worth having than this conquering sense religion might offer charms to the weak yet here religion itself became sensible and wore the garb of prosperity the stonework of the tall church on the corner was all lace and the very saints in their niches who had known martyrdom and poverty seemed to have renounced these as foolish and to look down complacently on the procession of wealth and power across the street behind a sheet of glass was a carrosserie where were displayed the shining yellow and black panels of a closed automobile the cost of which would have built a farmhouse and stocked a barn at eleven o'clock the appointed hour i was in wall street sending in my name i was speedily ushered into a room containing a table around which were several men but my eyes were drawn at once to the figure of the great banker who sat massive and preponderant at one end smoking a cigar and listening in silence to the conversation i had interrupted he rose courteously and gave me his hand and a glance that is unforgettable it is good of you to come mr parrot he said simply as though his summons had not been a command perhaps you know some of these gentlemen one of them was our united states senator theodore watling he as it turned out had been summoned from washington of course i saw him frequently having from time to time to go to washington on various errands connected with legislation though spruce and debonair as ever in the black morning coat he invariably wore he appeared older than he had on the day when i had entered his office he greeted me warmly as always hugh i'm glad to see you here he said with a slight emphasis on the last word my legal career was reaching its logical climax the climax he had foreseen and he added to the banker that he had brought me up then he was trained in a good school remarked that personage affably mr barber the president of our railroad was present and nodded to me kindly also a president of a smaller road in addition there were two new york attorneys of great prominence whom i had met the banker's own special lieutenant of the law mr clement d grolier for whom i looked was absent but it was forthwith explained that he was offering that morning a resolution of some importance in the convention of his church but that he would be present after lunch i have asked you to come here mr parrot said the banker not only because i know something personally of your legal ability but because i have been told by mr scherer and mr barber that you happen to have considerable knowledge of the situation we are discussing as well as some experience with cases involving that statute somewhat hasty to lay minds the sherman antitrust law a smile went around the table mr watling winked at me i nodded but said nothing the banker was not a man to listen to superfluous words the keynote of his character was dispatch 
the subject of the conference like many questions bitterly debated and fought over in their time has in the year i write these words come to be of merely academic interest indeed the very situation we discussed that day has been cited in some of our modern textbooks as a classic consequence of that archaic school of economics to which the name of manchester is attached some half-dozen or so of the railroads running through the anthracite coal region had pooled their interests an extremely profitable proceeding the public paid we deemed it quite logical that the public should pay having been created largely for that purpose and very naturally we resented the fact that the meddling person who had got into the white house without asking anybody's leave who apparently did not believe in the infallibility of our legal bible the constitution should maintain that the anthracite roads had formed a combination in restraint of trade should lay down the preposterous doctrine so subversive of the rights of man that railroads should not own coal mines congress had passed a law to meet this contention suit had been brought and in the lower court the government had won as the day wore on our members increased we were joined by other lawyers of renown not the least of whom was mr grolier himself fresh from his triumph over religious heresy in his church convention the note of the conference became tinged with exasperation and certain gentlemen seized the opportunity to relieve their pent-up feelings on the subject of the president and his slavish advisers some of whom before they came under the spell of his sorcery had once been sound lawyers and sensible men with the exception of the great banker himself who made few comments theodore watling was accorded the most deference as one of the leaders of that indomitable group of senators who had dared to stand up against popular clamour his opinions were of great value and his tactical advice was listened to with respect i felt more pride than ever in my former chief who had lost none of his charm while in no way minimizing the seriousness of the situation his wisdom was tempered as always with humour he managed as it were to neutralize the acid injected into the atmosphere by other gentlemen present he alone seemed to bear no animus against the author of our troubles suave and calm good-natured he sometimes brought the company into roars of laughter and even succeeded in bringing occasional smiles to the face of the man who had summoned us when relating some characteristic story of the queer genius whom the fates undoubtedly as a practical joke had made the chief magistrate of the united states of america all geniuses have weaknesses mr watling had made a study of the president's and more than once had lured him into an impasse the case had been appealed to the supreme court and mr watling with remarkable conciseness and penetration reviewed the characteristics of each and every member of that tribunal all of whom he knew intimately they were of course not subject to advice as were some of the gentlemen who sat on our state courts no sane and self-respecting american would presume to approach them nevertheless they were human and it were wise to take account in the conduct of the case of the probable bias of each individual the president overstepping his constitutional newtonian limits might propose laws congress might acquiesce in them but the supreme court after listening to lawyers like grolier and he bowed to the attorney made them made them he might have added without responsibility to any man in our unique republic that scorned kings and apotheosized lawyers a martian with a sense of humour witnessing a stormy session of congress would have giggled at the thought of a few tranquil gentlemen in another room of the capitol waiting to decide what the people's representatives meant or whether they meant anything 
for the first time since i had known theodore watling however i saw him in the shadow of another individual a man who like a powerful magnet continually drew our glances when we spoke we almost invariably addressed him his rare words fell like bolts upon the consciousness there was no apparent rift in that personality when about five o'clock the conference was ended and we were dismissed united states senator railroad presidents field marshals of the law the great banker fell into an eager conversation with grolier over the canon on divorce the subject of warm debate in the convention that day grolier it appeared had led his party against the theological liberals he believed that law was static but none knew better its plasticity that it was infallible but none so well as he could find a text on either side his reputation was not of the popular newspaper sort but was known to connoisseurs editors financiers statesmen and judges to those in short whose business it is to make themselves familiar with the instruments of power he was the banker's chief legal adviser the banker's rapier of tempered steel sheathed from the vulgar view save when it flashed forth on a swift errand i'm glad to be associated with you in this case mr parrott mr grolier said modestly as we emerged into the maelstrom of wall street if you can make it convenient to call at my office in the morning we'll go over it a little and i'll see you in a day or two in washington watling keep your eye on the bull he added with a twinkle and don't let him break any more china than you can help i don't know where we'd be if it weren't for you fellows by you fellows he meant mr watling's distinguished associates in the senate mr watling and i dined together at a new york club it was not a dinner of herbs there was something exceedingly comfortable about that club where the art of catering to those who had earned the right to be catered to came as near perfection as human things attain from the great heavily curtained dining-room the noises of the city had been carefully excluded the dust of the avenue the squalor and smells of the brown stone fronts and laddered tenements of those gloomy districts lying a pistol-shot east and west we had a vintage champagne and afterwards a cigar of the club's special importation well said mr watling now that you're a member of the royal council what do you think of the king i've been thinking a great deal about him i said and indeed it was true he had made perhaps his greatest impression when i had shaken his hand in parting the manner in which he had looked at me then had puzzled me it was as though he were seeking to divine something in me that had escaped him why doesn't the government take him over i exclaimed mr watling smiled you mean instead of his mines and railroads and other properties yes but that's your idea don't you remember you said something of the kind the night of the election years ago it occurred to me to-day when i was looking at him yes he agreed thoughtfully if some american genius could find a way to legalize that power and utilize the men who created it the worst of our problems would be solved a man with his ability has a right to power and none would respond more quickly or more splendidly to a call of the government than he all this fight is waste hugh damned waste of the nation's energy mr watling seldom swore look at the president there's a man of remarkable ability too and those two oughtn't to be fighting each other the president's right in a way yes he is though i've got to oppose him i smiled at this from theodore watling though i admired him the more for it and suddenly oddly i happened to remember what krebs had said that our troubles were not due to individuals but to a disease that had developed in industrial society if the day should come when such men as the president and the great banker would be working together was it not possible too that the idea of mr watling and the vision of krebs 
might coincide i was struck by a certain seeming similarity in their views but mr watling interrupted this train of thought by continuing to express his own well they're running right into a gale when they might be sailing with it he said you think we'll have more trouble i asked more and more he replied it'll be worse before it's better i'm afraid at this moment a club servant announced his cab and he rose well good-bye my son he said i'll hope to see you in washington soon and remember there's no one thinks any more of you than i do i escorted him to the door and it was with a real pang i saw him wave to me from his cab as he drove away my affection for him was never more alive than in this hour when for the first time in my experience he had given real evidence of an inner anxiety and lack of confidence in the future end of section twenty three